Morning, all. Can everyone hear me? Can hear you fine. Yes, thanks, Stuart. Okay, thank you, thanks everyone for uh, attending the first uh, NMIS Insights Online from the uh, Manufacturing Skills Academy team this year. Um, it's particularly relevant given the announcement of the Scotland leases um, this week, and you might have think we actually planned this for uh, Florian to, to come along today and give this um, session. Um, it's interesting as well when we look at the uh, attendee list. We've got um, you know over 20 people that are coming along for the first time, and probably around about 20 who are existing members um, or have attended before. We've got you know a dozen SMEs, large employers, um, and a good representation from Scottish stakeholders, um, and then another half dozen or so um, from abroad as well. So an interesting mix. So I'm going to go through <clears throat> um, a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of introduction around about the Manufacturing Skills Academy for those who haven't heard it before. Um, and then I'll be delighted to hand over to Florian at that point. So I'm Stuart McKinley, I'm the Skills Director for NMIS Manufacturing Skills Academy. And as I mentioned, I'll introduce you to Florian um, just shortly. So this session has been recorded and, and by continuing you're given your permission to, to approve that. Um, you can see that your microphones and your uh, cams will be switched off and we would encourage you to ask questions and, and interact through the chat tool. We will have some time at the end of the session for questions for both uh, Florian and myself. Um, and we'd be really interested in getting any feedback from this given it's the first session that we are doing on a more international context. So what is NMIS? Well, it's a group of industry led manufacturing R&D facilities bringing together research, industry and the public sector with the aim to work together to transform skills, productivity and innovation to attract inward investment uh, and to make Scotland a global leader in advanced manufacturing. So these are the th some of the things we've committed to do. We are a national asset um, and we've, we're mandated to help transform manufacturing in Scotland, but we have a, a bigger reach as well. So we're looking to increase productivity, stimulate investment. I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can get the general thrust of uh, what we are here to do. We are operated by the University of Strathclyde as part of the One Scotland team uh, and clearly supported by um, significant key stakeholders within their Scottish government, both Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, the Catapult, Scottish Funding Council and our local council, Renfrewshire Council. But we do work across Scotland and with a multitude of uh, employers and stakeholders across Scotland. Um, just a little picture on the NMIS group showing your core capability. Uh, the little bit down the bottom left there of your screen is the Manufacturing Skills Academy and, and we are up and running. The actual building itself, the new headquarters, we get the keys um, May this year and scheduled to open around about September, October time. We have a number of specialist centres and many of you might know the AFRC, which was instrumental in, in NMIS becoming what it is, uh, and we also have the Lightweight Manufacturing Centre as well. So a little bit on NMIS Manufacturing Skills Academy. We work right across the, the skills landscape in manufacturing, from uh, engagement with schools through the foundation apprenticeship, modern apprenticeship, and working with SDS on um, higher level and graduate apprenticeships. We've got doctoral programmes. Um, we have a, an AMCF, an Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund programme. Um, National Transition Training Funds uh, via Scottish Funding Council. And I've outlined the two in red because those are the ones that are probably of particular relevance to um, employers who may be on today and then any graduates. So if you're an SME, the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Fund provides free online content um, and, and there's some really cutting edge stuff on there and there's lots of support from 
and my team within the Manufacturing Skills Academy and a connectivity to the broader NMIS. Uh, and the other big piece of work we're working on at the moment is the National Transition Training Fund. I'll go through that in just a little bit of detail. So we have a programme on improving inclusivity in manufacturing. Um, so if you're an employer and you're struggling to recruit, we are actually working and we have ways that can introduce candidates you might not be reaching at the moment, whether those are female or people from ethnic minorities or other underrepresented groups. Um, and we are looking for employers to um, take part in some of the activities and also to reach out and provide some of the, the mentoring sessions uh, for the, the candidates. Um, and I'd encourage you just to get involved within that. We have a range of CPD content that we're developing, both um, what you might call traditional conventional uh, industry 4.0 content and uh, a net zero carbon pr uh, proposition as well. We're developing um, micro credentials. Obviously, people have less and less time to learn and there's increased pressures within the workplace. Um, that is looking really exciting and, and lots of interest from across um, the range there, even further afield out with Scotland. And we've launched the um, graduate first job programme. So if, again, if you're an employer, you find it difficult to, to get talent or your resources are really stretched. We are recruiting 50 graduates. We will be paying them real living wage for a three to six month contract and embedding them within employers at no cost to the employer. And all of that you can see on the, the link I've sent there or I've attached there. So, um, what I'm going to do at the moment is I'm going to introduce Florian. Uh, Florian Ellie is, a, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, Florian, is a senior researcher at ATH Zurich. He's an honorary research fellow at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL and a lecturer at the University of St. Gallen. His research and his teaching focuses on financing a low carbon economy and understanding the political economy around phasing out fossil fuels. So again, particularly relevant given the Scotland leases. He has co-founded several initiatives at the Science Policy Interface and serves on the board of the Swiss Young Academy. And he's a regular commentator on climate, finance and foreign policy issues in the Swiss media. He was a Mercator Fellow on International Affairs and he holds a Master's Degree in International Economics from the Graduate Institute of International and economic development studies in Geneva. So um, we are just absolutely delighted to have Florian here today and I will stop sharing my screen and uh, hand over to Florian. Well, I have to unmute myself. Thank you so much Stuart, thanks for the introduction um, and thanks everybody for being here and for attending this webinar. Good morning. So, I mean, perhaps as a, as a bit of as a bit of context. So, um, I'm based in Zurich at ETH, uh, as as um, as Stuart has mentioned. It's a technical university, and what we're trying to do um, here is we're trying to understand energy and climate transitions, and we're trying to especially understand the policy landscape around these transitions and governing these transitions and how to you know shape um, these policies optimally and now one of the big or crucial questions i would argue in this you know be it a green transition or an energy transition um, uh, whatever you want to call it to achieve um, um, climate targets to achieve net zero targets is the question of what happens to jobs right what happens to industry? What happens to jobs? Of course, different jobs will be required. Some jobs will kind of fall out and the demand will decrease. And the question is, how is that on balance? Um, and what, you know, how does it differ geographically? But um, most importantly, and what I'm going to talk about here is how are different skill sets um, involved in this transition? What you see here is a picture um, of a um, a, a, uh, a car, a car garage. So you know the um, the internal combustion engine will, for example, needs a lot needs a lot more maintenance and not a lot more labor hours um, to be kept in service compared to um, electric vehicles. So that is one example of where you know this transition um, will certainly have an impact have an impact on labor markets, which will which will dive into a little bit. And as um, Stuart has mentioned, perhaps as a last remark. Um, at the start here, 
um, you know, these these recent leases in Scotland, um, of course, they point to two things. Like one is, of course, there are new industries emerging. Um, for example, offshore wind industries. And the question is, who is actually going to work in these industries and what skill sets are required for these? Perhaps how can, you know, um, the existing labor force um, use reskilling or, you know, training optimally to transition to these jobs? And the second um, question is, you know, and then um, the government will generate revenues with that, for example, with the leases here and where um, is this money going and what kind of measures are financed with this money. So that's to give you a bit of an overview, um, maybe to open up. Um, now I'll share a little table of content. So I'll give you a bit of background, a bit of why this is relevant also for apprenticeships, um, not just, you know, skills, which is sometimes a bit abstract, but also the actual training. I'll introduce a framework to understand these transitions in, um, you know, uh, in the context of skills. And I'll give a bit of detail on some empirical analysis we've done and what, you know, is currently possible and what isn't. And then I think we'll, we'll quickly get into, um, you know, what are the, un the known unknowns? So what are the things we should know, but we don't at the moment um, to actually go through this transition and, and they'll have some, some discussion points. So high level, um, scene setting here, um, this transition to a greener economy is most likely disruptive. So as I said in the beginning, you know, some jobs will, um, demand for some jobs will increase and for others it will decrease. Um, everybody tells you in this situation, you know, the models, uh, whatever we know how, where we, where we, we're, we're going to go in this transition tells you that on net, net there will be a job increase. So we won't have a problem in terms of a net job loss, we'll have a net job increase. There will be many jobs that are created. Um, innovation will play a huge role in this transition. Um, but the question is, you know, is that really useful um, now to an industry um, player or to a government or a policymaker? If you know that on average, you know, there will be more jobs. Um, and we'd argue not necessarily because just within the European Union, 11 million geographically concentrated jobs um, are likely to either, you know, be lost completely or, um, you know, to be somehow adapted that the existing worker cannot, um, cannot actually take this job anymore. And this is substantial given what we know of how, you know, people um, actually oppose these transitions. If you look at, for example, the coal phase out um, that happened in many European countries, um, for example, in Germany as well, there is actually quite a bit of backlash. So people mobilize, and I mean, I would argue rightly so, um, if they, if their jobs are threatened and if they don't have appropriate, um, you know, opportunities to actually go into another job and 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 find, you know, recognition and 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 the salary elsewhere, and they organize politically, um, and that is, you know, something that that of course many politicians in the context of the European Green Deal, um, I imagine also in the in the Scottish um, context are afraid of, and therefore um, this can really, you know, slow down this green transition, slow down the move of the economy towards a climate um, compatible state. Now, what we know is that it's not necessarily that you need to compensate everybody. So if you've had a job and you've earned a decent salary, um, it's not, so much about being monetarily compensated, which of course helps, but it's not the whole story. So um, people, you know, are attached and societies kind of give recognition to work, to the concept of work, of, of jobs. And so it's generally not just a compensation game where you tell people, okay, now you lost your job and here we compensate um, you as, you know, as you're part of the, of the few unlucky ones um, in this in this greener climate transition. No, you actually need to upskill, reskill um, and offer these people opportunities to find new jobs and therefore, you know, be part of a community again um, and also support this transition politically. Um, I'll, I think I'll, I'll skip that. Um, of course, it also requires, you know, training um, the, the the people that are working in the in the increasing in the jobs with increasing demand, but I think that's the easier um, that's the easier part of the challenge that is um, that is at hand here. Now, why is this particularly relevant for a country? I would argue like Scotland and Switzerland, by the way, um, as well. You know, countries that place great emphasis on apprenticeship training. 
um, on not exclusively using um, university graduates, but actually have this, this very close interlinkage between industry and training. So, you know, um, this is a quick definition. I think this is not, this is not um, very useful, but, but the takeaway here is apprenticeship should be used for this forward-looking um, forward training, so to say, right? So young people, we should equip them with the skills they most likely require in a greener economy. Um, and for this, we have to, of course, understand which skills are those and, you know, um, which ones are particularly um, relevant in the context, for example, of Scotland. And then, you know, ideally, we'd even go more granular and we'd know, you know, um, how does, you know, Glasgow fare to perhaps a more rural region? And are there different skill sets required in these different regions? And can we optimize and design training around, you know, what we know, what local industries are, um, what industries are located in these regions, etc. However, then there is a second aspect. So that's the young people, you know, moving into jobs now in the next 10 to 20 years that will likely work in a sector of the green economy. Um, however, there is also um, what we call apprenticeship 2.0, um, because what we see is that a lot of the workers negatively affected by the transition to a green economy are typically, um, you know, towards the end of their of their professional career. So if you look at the retirement age of um, perhaps 65, which is around the average um, in Europe, um, these workers are typically older than um, um, than 50 years. And so what that means is, you know, they need to be retrained for them. It's not about, you know, their original apprenticeship, but it's about, you know, how can they what skills are perhaps easiest for them to acquire that can make them, you know, enable them to navigate the green transition. And there is a big lack here. Um, currently, there is no formalized on the job training for such workers. And it's very unclear, you know, which skills they would actually need. And this is also something that is very individual because, you know, you can say <laughs> that there has been these programs in, in West Virginia, for example, you know, you can say, OK, coding is an upcoming industry, you know, um, Python is a skill that you need, for example, to you know, manage a digital world. But then if you say, OK, um, we have, you know, a lot of a lot of people worked that worked in coal mines and in the industries around coal in West Virginia and the United States. And you say, OK, well, now let's retrain them and give them a skill of the future. So to say, which would then be Python coding, then this typically fails quite miserably because these skills are so far away from the skill set of this worker um, that this retraining doesn't doesn't work in practice. Now, you know, Common sense can tell you this, I would argue, um, but yet, you know, we have a lot of um, a lot of a lot of these reskilling programs designed in a way that are purely looking, okay, at what are these future skills, and then people just need to learn those. And I would argue you need to understand what are the actual skill sets of the people um, that are affected, and then go from there and see, you know, where can they find a role in this in this new green economy. Um, so the you know, to, to conceptualize a little bit this this um, this thinking, we have developed a framework and it's very simple and it's along two axes. And we believe that along these two axes, you need really good information in order to say anything meaningful. So the first point is aggregate impacts are not enough. So I think I've talked about that now um, sufficiently. And the second point is we need granularity on two axes. So we need granularity on the labor market. So we need to know what happens on the skills front. It's not enough to know, you know, an industry X is growing and an industry Y is declining, but we need to know um, what does that mean? What does this imply in terms of skills? And the second one is it's also not enough to know globally there will be a, an increase in jobs if we embark on a green transition. It's not enough to know on the EU level there will be an increase in jobs. Um, it's, I would argue, even not enough to know, you know, in the case of Scotland, there will be an increase in jobs if we embark on a green transition. You actually need to know it on a very regional level because people are very, very reluctant to move. Um, and, you know, they're unlikely if you, you know, think back um, two minutes now, 50 year um, old worker, they're typically male as well, those that are negatively affected by this transition. They're unlikely you know, to move. They probably have a family. They're 55 years old. They're not going to move far from like 
a another job for the last 10 years of their work life right so you need to understand a very regional on a very regional level the skills profile in demand and in supply to understand you know what can help you navigate through um, this this transition now what is a skill i've talked about um, skills quite a bit so here you see two um, jobs exemplary job, so a solar engine technician and the surface miner. And perhaps just look at the top at the top row. So what is called essential skills, and you get a bit of an impression, you don't know um, what these skills are. So mount photovoltaic panels or operate a mining tool. Um, and then so these are attached basically to to each job category that there is. There is a European classification framework, which is called ESCO, um, that basically maps out all you know, potential jobs that there are in the economy. And then you can basically, statistical departments can do an accounting um, exercise as to you know, how many jobs do we have in, in which job category. And each job has um, a certain set of skills attached um, to it. Now, what we'll do here in this exercise is will basically separate skills into you know, green skills that are most likely used in a green um, transition and um, what we call brown skills that are most likely attached to fossil fuel industries and will be in decreasing demand in the future. And we'll be able to you know, um, have a, a skills demand picture. How does demand for different skills evolve? And then um, based on that, um, we'll try to say something on, you know, who will be in what position in that transition and what kind of skills are lacking. Um, so this is the basic, the basic framework or, um, you know, approach that we're using. Um, so on the left, you see a li very little depiction of kind of the logical thinking. So, you know, there is an emission target to, to you know, stay within climate, within climate targets that gives you, you know, an evolution of the economy that gives you differences in industries and then, you know, differences in industry can be mapped to differences in jobs or occupations called there and that then can be uh, mapped to skills. So that's um, a quite a long, a long um, logical, I would say, chain. And that's also part of the problem, you know, to get from this very high level target that perhaps a country um, such as Scotland has in terms of achieving net zero, in terms of achieving um, climate targets to understanding really what happens on the skills level. Now on the right, you see um, every basically occupation, so source occupations on the y-axis and target occupations on the x-axis, and you see how many common skills they have, right? Um, so, you know, on the diagonal, it's, it's you move from one occupation to the same occupation again, and therefore there should be quite a lot of um, skills overlap, right? The closer you are to the diagonal. But what you see is basically you see that there is a lot of variance. So you see for some, you know, um, for some um, source occupations. So if you're working here, there's something around technicians and you want to move to a managerial position, then there is quite a bit of skills overlap, for example. And in other regions of this map, there is very little overlap. So you see a lot of variance. And our hypothesis now is that it's easier to move from one occupation to another occupation if you have a lot of common skills. So if the new occupation that you want to work in actually has a lot of skills overlap with your existing occupation, then this transition will be easier for you. And that's a first indication to understand, you know, now you know, okay, what kind of jobs are there in a given region? And you know, you know, what kind of jobs are likely to increase and decrease in that region and using the skills um, co-occurrence, so how many common skills you have, you can make a, let's say, a suggestion at least, you, which workers are most likely going to struggle because the demanded skill set is very far from their existing um, skill set. Now, if we apply this approach, um, apply this approach to this, what I told you, know, green, um, um, green um, um, and brown um, jobs, then um, you see that there is a difference um, in terms of how um, central these skills are. So how many essentially possibilities people in these in these sectors have to transition. So here you see, if you look at all the, um, the jobs there are, all the occupations there are, um, about 14% um, are classified as green, about 14% are somehow, you know, 
attached to the fossil fuel industry and about 70% um, or a bit more are neutral. So a shop assistant typically, you know, it's not clear whether demand will increase or decrease um, for that given job. And if we now plot these three categories and look at um, their skills, so the inherent skills that are attached to these occupations, how close are there to other occupations? You see that for green jobs, they're typically um, closer to other occupations compared um, to the others. So you see um, some sort of a rank order that tells you um, probably if you're working in, in these brown jobs that are you know, decreasing if we transition to a green economy, you will find it more difficult to transition to another job. Um, and that's kind of a first flag that tells you, okay, um, this might be, you know, this might be tricky, this transition. It might not just, you know, happen, um, happen on itself. Now, this is the skills angle. And the second dimension, dimension if you remember, was the, the spatial variation or geographical variation. And I'm going to show you just um, two maps of Germany, um, because Germany actually has regional data available through the EU statistical um, statistical services, which Scotland unfortunately does not. So for Scotland, I could only show you a map of the entire country. And given my point that regions are so tremendously important, this was kind of undermined, right? So, um, but it points to to a data problem that is prevalent in Scotland, at least for the data that is delivered um, into the EU statistical um, statistical units, um, and it is present in many other countries as well. Um, so, therefore, we look at Germany, and I'll show you two maps of Germany. On the left, you see those green jobs I told you before, and you see what's the employment fraction of these jobs of the total jobs um, by region. And on the right-hand side, you see the same thing. You see the employment fraction, but this time for the fossil fuel jobs, for the, the brown jobs. And what you see is that, I mean, I'm not going to talk to you about, it, you know, does it make sense where, you know, you see a higher fraction here or not. But what you see is there is a lot of variation. And you see there is a lot of variation on a very small geographical scale. So, you know, these are sometimes like you move 100, 200 kilometers east or west and you see the employment fraction is actually quite different. So um, for some, you know, regions in the very south here, um, you might say probably they're very kind of well placed. They have high shares of green jobs already and low, share, low shares of brown jobs. But for other regions here, like Thuringen in the center of Germany, for example, you see they have a profile where this is probably making it different, difficult um, to transition because they have a lot of jobs that will be affected by this transition. And now if you take those two concepts together and combine them, so you combine how many jobs are a threat together with how central is their skills profile, so how easy will it be for them to transition, you can construct something that we call, you know, at risk metrics. So you can say, um, you know, at risk regions are those regions where a lot of jobs are affected from a green transition. So a lot of jobs will actually be lost and where these jobs have particularly, um, you know, suboptimal skills profiles. So where these workers have skills that are not very close to other jobs and therefore will find it very difficult um, to transition. And, and I think, you know, exercises like this, I mean, are very important um, to have for, you know, a broader set of countries. And to be able to, uh, you know, to do this, you need basically granular data, which is one of the biggest, uh, biggest lacks in this whole transition that, you know, we've committed to something politically that on a data level, we're not actually even sure what this means. And I think this is, you know, I'm speaking, of course, from a research point of view, but we're also doing research with many companies and with many practitioners. And I think that's also an area where, you know, collaboration can be very, um, very meaningful and actually very useful to generate this granular data and to actually be able to deliver, you know, better insights. Now, I think my final point um, before kind of a concluding slide um, is the interlinkage with other transitions. Now, I've talked a lot about green transitions, um, but the question is, you know, there is also a lot of other things, of course, happening in the labor market. Um, and, you know, some of this might, you know, kind of move in parallel with the green transition and reinforce the effects of the green transitions, whereas other things, um, you know, might kind of, um, you know, dampen it in a sense, a positive sense, as to like work in opposite directions so that if you have, for example, a 
a, a transition towards more automation and a transition towards a green economy. The question is, does it hit the same workers twice in a sense? Or is there something that, you know, and perhaps these two transitions actually balance each each other off and 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 on aggregate, you know, um, might might be helpful so that, you know, an automation um, together with the green transition might actually be less hurtful to a lot of workers than just a green transition, for example. And what you see here is again, you see the brown, the green and the neutral occupations that that you know from before, and you see two um, things to measure, you know, a, a, a move to a more digital, a move to a more um, um, automated economy. Um, so a suitability for machine learning. So how suitable are these jobs, you know, to be done essentially uh, by a machine, so by a computer, um, and how prevalent are tasks in these jobs um, that will not, you know, that are not or are, are very, are very difficult to automate um, in in a in a setting um, in a machine learning setting, and you see that you know brown jobs typically have a lot of these bottlenecks jobs, so they might actually not be so much a threat from this transition towards you know more um, automated learning and and a digital economy. So that would be good news, right? That would point into a, to a direction where actually the jobs that are a threat in the green transition are not the same ones that are also at threat in a transition towards more machine learning and automation. However, bear in mind, this is extremely preliminary and, and we actually um, we don't know a lot except for some indications here that the effects are potentially uneven. And it seems that there is no double whammy on brown jobs. So it doesn't seem, at least in the case of machine learning, that those jobs that fall away in a green transitions are also those that are most at threat if you think about you know, which jobs are going to be lost if, if companies move to more um, digital and more um, machine learning based systems. Um, we've also done this in the case of COVID-19. So which jobs are most affected from this crisis? And there you see um, there is actually you know, the brown jobs, the fossil fuel industry jobs are actually very exposed um, to COVID-19. So there you see kind of a, some sort of this, this, this double whammy. So it depends a lot on what kind of transitions and labor market trends or, or you know, shocks you look at. Um, so I propose that I, I skip the slide on, on knowledge gaps. So I think there is a lot, um, essentially what this says is we need to know more granularly what happens in the labor market in order to produce meaningful advice. And in the end, this all comes down to the fact that, you know, aggregate numbers are actually not enough. Um, and we need a better understanding of the role of skills in the transition in order to design these formalized up and reskilling programs um, you know, that, that, that the Skills Academy is working on. And I think that are tremendously important. But again, um, it is at least on a European level at the moment, not the case that we really know which skills are the most promising for whom in which region if we look at the green transition. Uh, some recommendations um, from that. Um, the first one is, you know, to design more formalized green upskilling and reskilling. And for this, of course, you would need to understand first what is is kind of the optimal reskilling and upskilling um, curriculum, so to say. Um, then I think we need um, more efforts to actually model these transition impacts. Um, we need to harmonize across across countries um, so that we can actually um, you know, understand better what happens in a certain country versus another, and also understand better what are actual industries composed of. So it's not enough if we know, you know, there will be fewer jobs in the power generation industry. We need to know, okay, how many are there going to be in which technology, so to say. So it's a very different thing if we have a fossil fuel based um, generation plant as compared to an offshore wind plant. And if we Think about industries, then these you know differences are completely brushed over. And the last two um, things are basically also an invitation. So and, you know, um, I think it is absolutely crucial to partner here um, with industry, with data providers, um, but also just with people um, that are concerned um, with this transition and have have real real time insights because real time data is crucial. Um, so we are working on this on a European level and. Uh, we're always happy, you know, to dive deeper into into cases. And um, if you know Scotland is an interesting one um, from from you know one of 
one of the attendees' point of view now, then I'd be more than happy to engage in a conversation um, about what we could do and what we could look at in this. So that's it from my side. I look forward to the questions and the discussion. And um, here is my email as well and my Twitter account, so don't hesitate to get in touch afterwards if you have any thoughts that might not come up right now in the discussion, but half an hour later you think, ah, oh, this was really interesting and, and that's actually my idea now or my question. Don't hesitate. Please get in touch. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Stuart. Over to you again, I think. It's your, you're, you're on mute. Thank you. OK, thank you for the reminder I was on mute and thank you, Florian, for uh, I'm sure what everyone will agree is was a really fascinating um, dive into this area. Um, we would welcome some questions uh, or even comments or feedback. Um, we are particularly keen on um, further collaboration, uh, both within Scotland and you know internationally and within Europe. Um, so happy to have dialogue with anyone and, and happy if people feel it's uh, of, of value to explore working together um, with Enmis and with Florian going forward. Any questions? It's quite a lot to take in. Um, I, I know I had to, you know, reflect on Florian's presentation and then come back afterwards. So um, happy if if there are no questions at the moment to to let people digest it and then come back to us with a number of different ways you can get in touch with us. Um, Florian's I email. Stuart, I see some hands up, but I think Florian, you need yeah. to type a question in the in the chat. Right. I am going to stop sharing because I cannot um, see the screen there. I think they'd like to speak. Stuart, um, I think Prashant put his hand up first. Would you like me to just yeah, that allow good. him to speak? OK, yes, just thank you, Laura. Prashant, you should have your mic now. Prashant, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yes, I'm. Unmuted myself. There was talk of uh, synthetic petrol being developed, uh, which would uh, also uh, work the same way as uh, electric uh, power. It would be less polluting and uh, so on. So, uh, are you aware of the status of research? Particularly in Germany, this research was uh, has been taken up. That's what uh, I hear. It's not something I'm familiar with, Florian. I don't know if you have any comments. Yes, thanks, Prashant, and thanks for the question. I think I mean this is one of the big ones, right? Um, synthetic fuels, because there is a lot of there's a lot of things that that you know might not be decarbonized by using electricity and batteries, but might actually still require require fuel. If you think of um, if you think of international shipping, for example, if you think of long distance flights, I mean it's you know they won't um, they won't transition to to batteries and electric electric um, power anytime soon. So there, you know, the production of synthetic fuels is crucial. Um, now, if you're asking me about the skills profile of the synthetic fuels industry, that's something I actually don't know. And it's a, and it's an interesting point because... Um, okay, no, you know, no, I'm not asking about that. Uh, okay. So I would rather ask uh, about what... Do you have any recipe? for uh, skill transitions for uh, young people vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a recipe for a skill transition for mid middle-aged people like 50 year old old people or some somebody of that kind because uh, let's say somebody is working on conventional uh, uh, mobility and uh, one has to transition from conventional to uh, electric right so then uh, uh, what would what would be the shortest transition uh, for a 29 year old uh, and what would be the shortest transition for 50 year old shortest way to transition yeah. yeah yeah okay okay so i understand you better now i think i mean that's a great question i think i mean we we we'd have to we'd have to you know dive deeper into this bilaterally because i can't 
like the, what I showed you is basically the overall analysis. Now you could look at different occupations and look at okay, which of these occupations have a lot of young people or a lot of a lot of a lot of older people working there, and what are the um, what are the optimal you know transition um, pathways for them, and what are the optimal skills for the moment? How we can differentiate um, age is just by looking at you know what is the average age or what's the distribution of people, um, the age distribution of people working in a given occupation. And then we can say, OK, for that given occupation, what's an optimal um, transition pathway, right? Um, but, you know, you could also um, look at it from the other way around. And I think that's a great point that you're making. You could look at all the young people in the labor market and basically then aggregate up the occupations that they work in in order to be able to say something of, you know, what's perhaps the best transition um, pathway for, um, as you say, like a 19 or a 29 year old as compared to a 55 year old. Um, that's certainly something we have to investigate deeper. Prashant, thank you for your question. I suspect that's a, a conversation that will continue offline. Um, Laura, can you? Yep, next up we've got Robert Bruce. Robert, I've just uh, enabled your mic for you. Thanks very much, folks, uh, and, and good morning. Florian, thank you very much. It was a really interesting presentation, and it chimes and has much synergy with the work that we are doing here at Ingenuity uh, in terms of the engineering skills uh, direction. I think, actually, your observations around the data and the data insights and, and, and actually the collaboration around that work is critical and essential. One of the things that we're doing at Ingenuity and we're about to embark upon, and Stuart, perhaps you're already aware, is that we're about to take forward a project in Scotland regarding the redevelopment of the Scottish Modern Apprenticeship Programme for the engineering sector. And we're going to look at that in a multi-sectoral way. So, for example, we can see actually, begin to see the synergies of an apprenticeship programme that will work across actually more than just the engineering sector, you know, where actually these, these, these skills will, where we know there are already skills aligned. Some of the work we'll do at Ingenuity and we're already doing, we'll use ONET and, and ESCO uh, databases, which you've already made reference to, I think, in terms of your presentation. But we'll also actually be looking at, and one of the things that was quite interesting, we've done a project at Ingenuity around, for example, uh, something called a cell and gene project. And what we've been able to do is to look at actually, for example, using data science, where people can actually plot their skills in a careers converter and actually and, and look at actually how their careers, uh, their skills map to uh, a particular vacancy in another sector and how far away they are from that sector and what they need to do to be able to do that by identifying very clear gap analysis and actually then directing them towards the training and expertise actually that might, might allow them to make that journey. So I think it'd be really interesting from our point of view, actually, at Ingenuity, if we were able to make some contact with you, uh, perhaps our data science team, for example, would have an interest. And, and I think, Stuart, it would be really helpful, actually, as we move towards uh, our project around the, the apprenticeship programme and looking at how we incorporate that green skills agenda. Although I do have a challenge around what green skills are, if I'm being honest. Uh, I don't. I think we need some clarification around that. So, for example, in the example you showed, I would have said perhaps some of the essential skills were the development of electrical knowledge, and then the other ones around actually installing, for example, photovoltaic cells, was much more about installation and maintenance skills. You know, so in in a sense, there's a challenge there. Are they green skills or are they just actually an extension of engineering skills, but putting them in, putting them into a green environment and, and a green economy? I'll stop there, Stuart. So thank you, Robert. Really good, really good points. And of course, we're very happy to to work um, with you and support in that change in the in the apprenticeship framework. I think in, in regard to the green jobs and green skills, what are they? I think it's a debate we're all having, isn't it? We've all been to multiple conferences where everyone goes along expecting somebody to have the, the magic bullet, but it doesn't really exist. We're all finding out as we go along. And I think we will for you know a number of years yet have the conversations around about what are green jobs, what are green skills, and what are greener jobs or green skills and, or, or brown jobs. Um, Florian, anything you want to, to add there? Yeah, I mean, two quick things. I mean, Robert, um, please do get in touch. I mean, it sounds it sounds very relevant. Um, we're also working together um, in this in this in this area um, with a with a company based in Amsterdam that that is looking more at this you know supply level and looking at okay how can we you know understand people's skill sets some some things that you've mentioned you know and then tell them how far they are from a certain career path so there are always this there's always this like very micro lens that looks at the individual worker and then 
um, there is the macro lens that tries to figure out, okay, what do we have to do in terms of policy making um, to, you know, to you know, accommodate this transition optimally? And of course, um, you know, the two come come with caveats, but but they're equally important in my opinion. So it would be great um, if you can reach out. That's the first thing. And the second thing, on quickly on on green skills. Um, of course, I mean that's that's a huge debate, and 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 we can, as you say, Stuart, maybe have this again and again, um, also in a couple of years. But I think that, that perhaps almost the most interesting ones are the ones that you referred to, Robert, as you know, you know, I don't know what you how you term them exactly, extended engineering skills, for example, right? Like skills that are potentially already in the economy and quite widespread, but they're essential to actually the jobs needed in a green economy. So then um, this, this, these offer really nice and interesting transition pathways, perhaps more so than you know, skills that are exclusively, so to say, green and new and emerging skills that, that come up with the green transition. Um, and those might then be more suitable for actual you know, um, apprenticeship training early on, as, whereas the others are probably candidates for, for the reskilling um, of existing of the existing workforce, right? So this is an interesting differentiation um, also, I think within green skills, you know, are they new or are they more transversal, and therefore, how suitable are they to what to what um, to what types of workers? I think you had a question from Wabi Isaac. Have you, what does the future hold for remote jobs and remote works in line with green jobs? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I think given given the the pandemic situation, you know, any, anybody that that makes a statement about what the future holds is is, is doomed to fail, so to say. Um, no, but so what we've done is, you know, when I, I've I've mentioned it in one bullet, um, the interlinkage with with COVID, and that's of course the interlinkage with remote work, for example. And what we've seen is that a lot of the of the greener jobs. Um, can be done more easily um, remotely, um, require less physical proximity, therefore less exposure. Um, also, you know, um, to the virus in that in that in that example. So, um, I mean, the the and then that's you know that's not a very deep answer now, but but I think from from the analysis, the preliminary analysis that we've done so far, I think it's it's fair to say that um, generally, you know. People working in in you know fossil fuel or brown um, occupations um, have been exposed much more because their jobs require more physical um, proximity, and therefore um, you know they struggle also more if if you know the economy moves to a remote um, remote status, and that is of course very directly linked to the fact that that a lot of the green jobs. Um, or I mean, some of their solar installers, they need to go out and install solar panels. Of course, you can't do that virtually or remotely, but a lot of the jobs that are related to the green economy um, are, you know, um, are more related to working on a computer and, and can therefore be done remotely. So I don't I don't want to make a statement as to, you know, how is that evolving in the future? But what I can say is that, you know, if we're moving towards an economy that involves more remote work, then this will potentially um, be easier for those people working in green sectors already as compared to the others. Yeah, I, I would agree with what you've said there, Florian. I, I think, you know, over the past year and a half, two years, we have seen that that, that move. I mean, I, I know even just kind of reflecting across Scotland and within Enmis, we've all got people working in locations, working from home that, you know, traditionally people would have said, well, that's not going to work. That'll never happen. That'll, that just will never happen. Um, and actually it's working. Now, I guess there's a debate about, you know, how well is it working and, and could we be getting more? Uh, for example, I think, you know, if we look at productivity, there was lots of employers reporting productivity gains as we moved into the pandemic and into lockdown. Um, but really, those were short term wins, I think, and a lot of the the bigger productivity issues where, you know, we, we gain from people having those informal conversations are, are we're, we're losing many of those. So it's about how we, we find an effective way of going forward. But I think the general direction of travel is, 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 it's like King can you? It's not, it's not going to stop. Um, and of course, we are similar to many SMEs. I mean, we have, you know, facilities within Enmis, within, say, the forging or the the forming, where we have, for, for example, a furnace, um, where, because it's small batch or one offs, um, it's it's really not practical and feasible to to automate all of that. Um, so there has to be a high degree of of people working on site. But equally, many of our staff are now um, working from home, although they have the, the option to come in. 
Any further questions or comments? I'm aware we're kind of getting towards the end of the, the session. Well, I think Stuart McPherson has raised his hand, so I'll just enable his mic. That's you, Stuart. You should be able to speak now if you unmute. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just a, a question from a Scottish perspective, if, if I may. Uh, I'm Stuart McPherson. I work for Highlands and Islands Enterprise and I work in the, in the west coast of, of Scotland. Uh, very interesting, uh, Florian, uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thank you, Stuart. And in particular, uh, Florian, your your um, insistence, which was very good to hear from our perspective, on the importance of regional data uh, and even the differences within within regions. Um, the reason why I'd like to speak just quite quickly is just make you aware of a of a, a, a admittedly quite small but real exercise we are embarking upon, and and um, I'd be keen in due course. To seek any any assistance from yourself and and, and Stuart as as we progress, it, it might be of interest to you. So we're embarking on a very practical exercise in conjunction with Skills Development Scotland uh, to uh, study existing employer employer requirements um, at the port of Kishorn, a large deep water port uh, in Kishorn on the west coast of Scotland, uh, with a dry dock now. I don't expect people to know or, or indeed remember, but Kishorn um, was where the Ninian oil rig platform was built in the early 70s, which at the time was the largest uh, floating uh, man-made structure in the world uh, that really kicked off the oil industry in, in the North Sea. And and there, so obviously because of the, the quayside and the deep water and the dry dock, they're in a prime uh, position with potentially, we hope, with respect to, to Scotland. But we are now in a, a fascinating situation where those issues are arguably slightly similar, but slightly different to the, the east of our region, which is NIG, and where understandably much of the manufacturing capabilities might be might be built out, which would be fantastic. But we we have a, an issue where the demand for skilled labour is going to be extremely high. And we don't want we want to try and make the labour market work as best as possible. Mm -hmm. So we're serving uh, employers. Um, if what skills do they need when? Um, and we are working alongside those employers in partnership with West Highland College, who are part of the Advancing Manufacturing uh, Challenge Fund uh, project. So that we we want to know what the issues are, and then we also want to try and figure out what the solutions are. Um, and we're, we're, we're particularly interested in it because of the very rural and remote area um, that, we're, that we're operating. And essentially, you know, a once in a generational opportunity to try and materially uh, enhance that area and take the benefits uh, from this work. So thank you for listening. I hope you don't mind me just explaining that. Um, it's a very practical, real exercise. So any additional professional expertise that um, may be able to be brought into it would be hugely welcome. Thank you. Sure, what, what, what a great question. As you see, a very practical example and very topical uh, as well. Um, we'd be delighted to, I mean, we're working closely with, with, as a national asset, we are working closely with UHI and and High and, and you know, West Highland College so, um, and Skills Development Scotland. Um, so really keen to work with you and, and Florian and, and look at something in there we can do together. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. I mean, I mean, yeah. Please, please do, um, please do get in touch. Um, I think if you were, if you were talking about, you know, more the question of of how to survey skills, um, then you know perhaps this this uh, this company that we're partnering with in Amsterdam, which is actually developing this as a business model, um, would also be a nice uh, a nice you know um, a nice partner to to talk to. Thanks. I think there's probably just time for one final question. Um, Florian Richard Buxbaum, and hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, Richard, um, says this was very interesting. When developing the projections or models that you've used today, what time span are you using? And is there any guidance on what the optimal length of time required to accurately identify areas of transition and in theory develop the training support or programmes required for first time apprenticeships and apprenticeships 2.0? Yeah, great, great question, Richard. Thank you. I mean, 
Um, so <laughs> to some extent, this is um, this is aiming at a moving target, right? Um, so that that makes it difficult because you know as you or as we all you know progress in in this green transition, we we learn more. We learn more about what these jobs are, how they are, you know, what skills are used, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so in essence, you know, it's very hard to to make any any sort of uh, estimations about the future, including you know time spans necessary um, for such transitions. So the analysis that I've showed you so far is. Um, is in that sense, um, you know, abstracting from the question of how long it takes, because it it simply looks at the current occupational structure of an economy, and then you know tells you, okay, how far is this from a desired occupational you know composition of the economy, which we will most likely use in a green transition, and then of course you go down, you know, um, to a more regional level, etc. But the question of how long this actually takes is absolutely is absolutely crucial and is interesting. And for this, um, you need real time data, right? You need to know um, how from I mean, from a job X to a job Y, how long um, does it take people to transition depending on how far away the skills profile of X is from Y? And that's actually precisely some of the things that we're working on. Together with this, uh, with Skill Lab, they're called um, in Amsterdam. This this uh, this startup that I've mentioned, because for this, what you need is you actually need, you know, skills profiles of 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 workers, and you ideally need to know how they have changed jobs in the past to make a um, any statement on um, on you know how long is something likely to take, how long is a certain switch likely to take. But I mean, this is a great question. I think it's a hugely policy relevant question that unfortunately I, I cannot. I cannot comment further on because we just don't know at the moment. Uh, and also because we're really out of time. So <laughs> uh, listen, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, first and foremost Florian uh, and like to thank everyone that's attended today. I think this has been a particularly interesting um, conversation. Um, we would welcome feedback and comments and working with, with people are exploring opportunities to do so. I would encourage you to complete the survey and that will give you the link to the, the YouTube video of this recording. Um, and I'll hand you back to um, Debbie at this moment. Thank you all. That's great. Thanks very much, Stuart. And yes, just to reiterate what Stuart had said, thanks very much to you all for joining us today. And thanks again to Florian and Stuart for excellent presentations. And we will just stop the recording now and bring the webinar to a close.